Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to Environmental Podcast. Yeah, this is our podcast where we investigate different aspects of sustainability. We choose a topic every month and we go really deep and investigate it. Mm -hmm. And this month we are going to be learning more about food, food production, agriculture, kind of all, anything food yeah. related this is a really big topic. It feel like it feels like it might be another longer than a month topic, but I don't know. Let's see how we feel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we are transitioning out of talking about energy and but something that we kind of continuously saw when looking into energy was how much is wasted when in regards to agriculture and food production so that's yeah. what really kind of opened this door that we're now traversing yeah. down the hallway of right now of yeah. trying we're to like <laughs> can we talk about tractors though <laughs> <laughs> we can that's we need to we yeah, yeah we need to talk about tractors now yeah what what are your thoughts on tractors well, in general, I actually really like tractors. I think that they're really cool, but yeah. they're problematic, you know? And fun fact, maybe it's not that fun for other people, but I um, grew up going to the Buckley Engine Show, which is just south of Traverse City, just Michigan. south maybe, in Michigan. Yeah, and... Um, it's like a really cool little craft fair thing, but then their whole, their whole point is literally a, uh, tractor parade. Oh, wow. <laughs> a parade of tractors. Cause it's just farm country over there. Yeah. So I'm not going to claim to know a lot about tractors, but I will say that like we've we've been using the same technology to harvest our food for like a hundred years or something and I'm sure there's been some innovation but yes yeah, i mean yeah did, there's been a lot of innovation big but. diesel engines are still the driving force behind much of our agricultural industry so yeah that is true. yeah yeah. yeah, and how do we transition away from that? That's something I legitimately, like, want to know mm -hmm. about. Like, those engines are so big and they have to do so much. And I don't think that we've reached the point with with electric no. engines that yeah. they can handle our food production. Yeah, I mean, interestingly, here I am seeing more um, not ad not advertisements, but just availability of biodiesel. Oh, um, yeah. So where I live in Ventura County is a really agricultural area. Um, it is a lot of farmland and so that's been really cool to see I'm like oh like I and I asked my my boyfriend Mike I was like does that actually mean like what I think it means <laughs> like is yeah. that actually like recycled like is that like the biodiesel that like people you know five ten years ago were like converting their like old yeah. diesel engines to be able to take like vegetable oil vegetable oil or like old restaurant oil yeah. and that was my understanding of what biodiesel was and I believe that that's what is becoming more available um which yeah, is, but but is there a then the, then the question is is there a demand for that because you have to change the you still have to change the engine over to be able to support that right I don't know if I don't it's not changing the entire engine there is a piece there's something um I don't know probably some sort of a regulator or something I don't know the words don't come at me uh <laughs> <I don't. laughs> listen internet can't know all the things um, right now. I can ask I can ask because uh one of my boyfriend's favorite activities <laughs> is looking at big engines he just loves wow. big 
Mr. I bet he knows the answer to that. He does know the answer. I'm sure of it. Very smart boy. But um, yeah, man. Uh, so that would be interesting to know. Um, but that's, yeah, kind of one very tiny aspect of yeah higher topic of how our food is produced and sourced and shipped and where it goes and access and it's a big topic it's a really big topic and yeah it's hard to choose where to start because yeah do we start with access or do we start with waste or how it's grown or yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think it it makes sense logically to start with kind of the production side of things, but yeah, I mean, you can look at agriculture through two very different lenses through, you know, kind of the ecological footprint, right, of what's happening with the amount of fossil fuel usage, of course, the amount of like monocropping, the just mm-hmm. the just demolishing the soil quality and all of that yeah (laughs) um but there's also a social aspect of it too right Mm -hmm. where that's you know that's the traditional way of doing things that's like the way to kind of flip things and make the most money in the quickest way so it makes sense that that's what people are doing because farmers need money yeah And there's the other, I mean, there's another piece of it, which is food security. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Once the the food is produced. Yeah. Who gets it? Yeah. And, and food security and food waste being on two different sides of the same coin. And that's, that's something that I started looking into this week when we, um, we decided to talk about agriculture and food and food waste. And I started looking into where food gets lost and who has access to eating, eating it. And like one in six people in the States are food insecure, but at the same time at the farm, they're wasting or not harvesting 20 to 30% on a regular basis. So it seems like we have a logistics issue also in relation to getting, getting the food we need to the place it needs to go actually, because we also waste a shitload from the grocery store. Like, yeah. When we do have access and we can buy the food we want, we waste that too. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. On like every level there is waste. And even, even if the farms can like logistically get food to grocery stores, there's like arbitrary, like aesthetic rules around what food can look like in order to be like, I don't know, a, acceptable by some sort of standards yeah. of grocery like, stores. Who makes that law? Who I mean, no, who makes that rule? Who, mm-hmm. who like is it the president of the of the grocery, grocery store being like I only sell pretty produce? I don't people, know. People buy it less, that's true, but they don't just not accepting it shouldn't be the answer, right? Yeah. And it, and is it, are, it almost seems, and I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised if this was true, that food insecurity is by design. It's, yeah. It's, it is not something that needs to be because there no. is so much waste on every level of the production chain. And, and right. because where we have these like appearance rules and so in order to keep prices high they just get they throw away food rather than like giving it away to people who are potentially food insecure 
Right. Or there, and not, or, but, and there are like these food deserts Mm -hmm. that exist in largely minority communities. Yep. And they, where you have to go five miles to get to the nearest grocery store, Mm -hmm. to get access to fruits and vegetables. You like, you just can't, or like, if you don't have a car, how are you going to get to the grocery store? How are you going to bring your groceries back? You don't, you don't, you go to the convenience store, you spend more money for less healthy food. Yeah. And it is by design. It yeah. is like, it is. That, that is absolutely, um, yeah. And a, 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 something that is a holdover from redlining and making, you know, city wide ordinances of where things can be and, Yeah. So this, yeah, the conversation about food, absolutely. Like it it immediately tips into social justice and, and, and racial justice and, um, yeah. And also deep into stuff we've talked about, like sourcing and deforestation and a massive global impact, like Fixing our food system should be um, a, a priority, yeah. a global priority. Like, just in general, I'm, yeah, yeah, period. <laughs> yeah. It's broken on every single level. It is, and, it, and it's so, so, so wasteful. And if we're trying to come up with sustainable solutions for the future, that eliminate waste or that you know reduce negative impacts this is one industry that really really needs um needs a, an overall a whole shake shake down yeah, yeah. <laughs> um right but that's the thing it's such a sneaky thing it's like who made these decisions in the first place why is how, it how did we get here how did we get here yeah I, that's something I, I think we're both sort of like, this topic is so big. Where do we start? How do we have this conversation? Because Mm -hmm. it feels to me like the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know about food waste and about agriculture and how deep rooted, I mean, it's food. It's one of the, the basic resources and it is utterly fucked up. Yeah. And it, it irks me. It's like, how did we, why did we make these? Why did, how did we get here? What are we doing? Why do we think we need all this food? Are we farming hungry? Like we're wasting everything. Mm -hmm. Are we farming hungry? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It's a weird, yeah, it is a weird, weird industry where there is so much abundance and so much waste, yet also so much insecurity and like, and, and, um, unequal access and it's Mm -hmm. wild. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there are some really cool food programs out there that like the ugly produce, um, imperfect CSA. Yeah. Do you remember what that was called? Was it called ugly? Imperfect. Imperfect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's cheap and it helps make things accessible and it's much, I don't think it's available everywhere. It's not. Um, I know it's available in California and perhaps not even everywhere. Um, that's a good question because that that is something that's really cool and that and so that that organization was created entirely to shine light on that the like aesthetic weird appearance regulations about yeah. food at, for grocery stores like bananas have to be certain within a certain length or else they're just thrown away it's like yeah it's it's so arbitrary it's insane yeah um yeah, and they focus on making it, making fresh food accessible to people that 
don't typically have access or like can't get to a grocery store because they're a delivery service, for instance. But I don't know. Yeah, I don't know where they're located. And it looks like it's actually just the Bay Area, Los Angeles, Portland, Seattle, Midwest and parts of the East Coast. So it's a little bit selective um, where that particular program is. But yeah, um, I think they connect with farmers. So I think like they they're really intentional about who they're getting their produce from that's cool yeah that's Um, very cool yeah and then they don't they try to keep things local so it is growing because when we first heard about them I think they were like just in the just on the west coast so that's really great and yeah yeah and it looks like they're not just produce anymore that they do have some packaged goods and some pantry items that I don't know how they're sourcing that. I think that they get things at like a bulk discount or maybe things that it's essentially things that the grocery stores wouldn't accept because of some weird regulation or some weird yeah. rule, but the food is still perfectly totally good. Fine. Yeah. yeah. So it's a really, that's a really beautiful solution. And I think that we'll, we'll ideally see more of that. Yeah. Popping up. This is just one example. I think there's actually like a bunch out there. So if yeah. you're, if you're, there's one here and I don't know, don't know what it's called, but it's essentially, it's a, it's a really similar thing. Um, it's a, the local farmers and then you sign up for a box and then they don't, they'll sell to the grocery store, but they don't, um, they give it to like the direct subscribers first mm-hmm. and they just drop off a CSA box at a spot mm-hmm. here. Stuff like that happens. Yeah. That's, that's, a, that's a pretty popular, yeah. Like set up, I guess, um, for, for CSAs, community supported agriculture. Yeah. Very cool, man. But yeah, there's a lot of questions that we hope to sort of investigate over this month. Um, this, the concept of food sovereignty and food security, I definitely want to investigate further, I see that word, that term food sovereignty used a lot as like a a sustainable solution to food security for all. Um, And though I did a little bit of of research into it this week, I definitely still feel like I don't know the full picture. So that's something that I hope to learn over the course of this month. Yeah. And I'm really interested in... um, like the impact of transport and food. Like if we're talking about food waste and I, I tried to start looking into it and obviously the ideal solution is local, but how much waste happens in transport and how big is the global impact? Like, can we offset global impact of wasted food and landfills letting off methane with transporting it a little farther or turning it into a CSA or something like that. Like how important actually is local, especially if the food was just going to be wasted. You know, if I have a farmer over here, who's going to, who just, who is now wasting 30% of his food, does it make in California, does it make sense for Louisiana trucks to come get it? Like, right. What, where it's like the Hmm. That's interesting. So like, what is, what's the more sustainable option for it to just be wasted in California because rather than being shipped to somewhere where it wouldn't be wasted. Yeah. Carb. Yeah. Is that. And then does that help? Would that help with food waste altogether? Is food waste and, and, um, an access issue really, or is it a monetary issue or especially as it relates to like the United States, because Mm -hmm. I think in other parts of the world, you're going to have different answers to that question. Mm -hmm. But I think it's, I think it's probably both access and also monetary. Yeah. Would something like this food is going to be wasted anyway, or not harvested um, would it, there, is there a way to balance that out? Mm-hmm. Cause it seems to me like a pretty clear 
pretty simple solution to like we shouldn't have hungry fucking people when we're also wasting food right when we're also yeah. wasting food. <laughs> right that's the that's the weird yeah how do we have both things be are, that are true right now yeah i'm really interested in the logistics of in the ideal situation what does that logistic look like so that we can solve both problems mm-hmm. at the same time because they are each other's solution. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, I'm, I'm, and I think just answering the question of how did we get here? I think that that's something that I'm, I'm really interested yeah. in is like, how did, how was this solved f- before like kind of capitalism ran rampant and changed our whole existence, you know, yeah. within the past 50 years, 60 years. Um, like what changed or maybe nothing changed and it's just like that thing Tom was trying to explain math at me when we were tiling and it's like if you have a tiny a, a tiny bit of crooked over here stacked on top of each other by the time you get to the top it's like mm-hmm, mm-hmm. because that this it compounds right the issue compounds so is that what is that what happened? Did the issue compound? We just didn't solve it until now it's a massive problem and we have to try to backtrack or did something change? I mean, I think it's the the answer is probably the same thing t- as like like what changed so like fast fashion is now the base the standard you know it's kind of the same it's like we've yeah through this process of becoming less reliant on individual small grocers grocers right and it being that like nationwide chains Mm -hmm. they're sourcing things from all over the world now and so and and so they're able to cut their prices they're competing with those small local grocers the small independent guide can't compete so they closed so now we just are stuck with this like corporate Mm -hmm. food system that doesn't take into consideration any sort of human aspect I guess right. it's really just more environmental aspect it doesn't take into consideration anything anything, anything except for money and profit yeah um yeah because like yeah food accounts for 25 percent of the global gas emissions the greenhouse gases food like being like food waste like compost or like not okay agricultural system in general which includes yeah food waste being like methane i don't know if they include this study comes from our world and data.org um in an article about environmental impacts of food Mm -hmm. and i don't know if they take like transportation cost or any of that into consideration i think it's just um production okay. and supply and waste. Yep. 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 It is like a <laughs> huge, it's big, a quarter of our greenhouse gas emissions. Mm-hmm. You want to solve Like we want, we have to solve this climate change problem. It seems to me like getting real serious about solving the food issue that we have, the agricultural issue, the food sovereignty problems it seems like that kind of solves all the things, you know, that kind of like is a nice little mm. bundle with a lot of messy logistics and, and details, but like, it feels like <laughs> a nice little bundle to be like, solve the food problem <laughs> and global warming and not everybody's hungry. And like, you know, but in theory, perhaps, yeah. right. I yeah. mean, but that's again, sort of like, how did we get here? Why is it not that way? Um, right, right, right. Like, why didn't we think about that? Well, we didn't think about anything. It just like, 
Yeah. Business just kind of, you know, business has been good. The business of wasting food and shipping things all around the world makes the fossil fuel industry very happy. Mm -hmm. Uh, So until now where people are really taking a critical look at, at these systems that we've been that we've grown accustomed to, um, there was no incentive to change, you know, not at all. And um, yeah, but, but now it's, is definitely a time to, to, to sort of have that, that look um, and rethink how, how we exist and, and how this necessary part of every human's daily life <laughs> uh yeah happens how yeah yeah we've become so disconnected from from our food in general and yeah. uh i mean the good news is there's a lot of room for improvement and there's a lot of yeah and there's a lot of room almost for, only yeah only yeah but there's a lot of room for like personal change yeah will make a big enough impact to where we can see okay this is an impact right like the way that we choose to buy our food has a direct impact on the grocery store or the farmer that we buy from so if you are very intentionally purchasing from a farmer and not the grocery store for your vegetables that that has a a direct impact on food waste Mm -hmm. food security and food sovereignty and in our in our system and one person's impact doesn't obviously make a huge difference but building a community around that and having a conversation around it can Mm -hmm. because we are at the bottom of the barrel yeah (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah um we really, really are. Yes. I mean, kind of everything that, that look doing this research over the past week, um, has been really kind of surprising in that regard where, yeah, we, there's really no place to go, but up, um, because it kind of can't get that much worse. We're, we are super malnourished, even though we are eating lots of food we are eating terrible food yeah people are not healthy it is wild right um right our food isn't as nutrient dense the food even that comes from the ground isn't as nutrient dense but also we're manufacturing food that is like half fake weird food that is not real so that, that has very little nutrients in it. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> right. Yeah. That, right. And, and again, it's, it's kind of a lot of the choices that farmers have made is to like, okay, they want to breed some of their fruits, vegetables to be bigger so that they look better or whatever. And it's like mm-hmm. this, they're still trying to like fit within these weird appearance regulations which I that is something I also want to better understand yeah is it regulated or is it like just from the grocery store or is it yeah where did that come from yeah I don't know but it's like because they're breeding food items to be bigger then they by default will be less nutrient dense Mm mm-hmm but um and also monocropping right saps the soil of nutrients Mm -hmm. to grow that crop because the crop is using it up not replacing it and then the crop doesn't grow as well it doesn't yield as much it doesn't have as much nutrients and it's this cyclic thing i've been Mm -hmm. really interested in companion planting um which is which is a way to plant food and herbs and flowers and vegetables and everything um, to where they help each other grow. So 
like nasturtiums and tomatoes should be grown together because one of them fi fixes nitrogen and the other one that's don't quote me on that but that's kind of like how that system works they feed each other better nutrients it becomes mm -hmm. a holistic system it's really nice it's and your yield is better and you can keep growing your plants right. in your in the in that way and it's way prettier it is it is and this is like knowledge that's been around for the since the beginning of humans like yeah, this, this is, is how it this is how native peoples grow things right and yeah there's a there's definite potential with yeah. that yeah um that was a really interesting article to read that was from uh bioneers just about that how, how food is losing its nutritional value um, yeah. Like a tomato, eating a tomato in 1950 would probably so good. I can't even imagine. Yeah. And versus now it's just, it's alarming. It's really wild yeah. that um, I keep using that word wild, but yeah, it's just because it's mind blowing. It's like, yeah. how are we letting this happen? We don't know. Yeah, we don't have a whole lot of control in in this no. it's something that's like just happens behind the scenes and it's and it shouldn't right it yeah. does but it's also it's like these massive industries have no incentive to make people healthy. No. They don't. Also, we don't even need to get into this, but I am something I really want to talk about eventually is like the connection between big ag and fossil fuels and big pharma and like mm -hmm. those three industries are you know they circle around each other they all go to the same parties they know the same people they network in the same groups yep if you don't think that some of it is intentional and purposeful yeah. you're 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 a little naive right yeah and, and like, it's like yeah and i know i know that that definitely tips into the, like conspiracy theorist world but it's just not though no, like that's it's just not. it's yeah. like it, it's just kind of logical that like <laughs> right big pharma wants us to be sick right With they the, get hella the, money when we're sick right you know it, how much does like diabetes medicine cost like or insulin or you know insulin in the states is insane right so it's expensive. right right and there's no yeah i mean right we we Just could have one example like <laughs> we, we could have a whole we, we could go into pharmaceuticals actually that might be an interesting one eventually but yeah, um i would be interested in that we because as an herbalist like i can't legally practice and i can't get insurance in the states because big pharma in the early 1900s spread a bunch of bullshit and made herbalism illegal and it never reached legal status again it kind of got to where it was like we're not going to bother the herbalists but mm -hmm. i guarantee you that if you see a big enough resurgence in herbalism that big pharma will bring their lawyers to the table because they lose money when people use natural healing resources yep Yep. Things that just are from the earth. Yes, they sure yes. do. Um, yeah, man, it is definitely all connected. Um, this is going to be a really, conspiracy podcast. This is going to be a really big, <laughs> yeah. it sort of is, but it's all the same systems that we've been talking about for months. You right. know, it's just like, billion dollar industries want to continue to keep themselves in power yeah why would they not and this is how they do it and yes. it's worked like a charm it works great so mm -hmm. it's our mission to help disrupt that any way that we can yeah so at least yeah. just by looking into it and and talking and about it yeah. And I think to some extent, like, you know, what we're learning and what we're sharing is stuff that I think everyone should know and everyone should research and it's readily available. 
you know, you have to dig a little, but really it's a lot of Googling and reading and listening, you know, research it. That's just, that's just what it takes. But people spend like two hours a day in social media land uh, and not 10 minutes a day reading about this stuff, you know, and if we did that and if we create a culture of that and we start talking about it in this way, maybe we will start to see massive shifts in the mainstream culture. That's my hope. Yeah, that the, the people just become more engaged in their own life. Yeah, let's talk about engagement, not in terms of how many likes you get on social media, but engagement into like, are you actually looking into things that might make your community better? Are you looking into things that might make yeah. your, you as an individual healthier, better? Yeah. Have less impact. Yeah. I think food is a great way to do that. It is. It is. It is because it's an active choice that you make three or more times a day, probably, maybe less. I don't know. Everyone has a different yeah. eating schedule. but I could pretty much always have a snack. <laughs> it is it is a universal language food is a, it is universal so yeah and it is an it is a conscious choice you have to make every single day is like where am yeah. I gonna go to get lunch right that's when conversations like this that we hope to share will ting in your brain be like yeah like oh I should go to the local farm stand yeah and maybe not the get the plastic packaged shit from the grocery store or from mm -hmm. McDonald's or from the whatever. Right. 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 Yeah. And as a side note, I would like to talk about the meat industry. Yeah. Like we talk a lot. I mean, we've talked right now just about like farming and vegetables and fruit and monocropping and, um, but I think meat and seafood like I, it's I, that kind of feels like its own situation, but I would like to touch on it this month if possible because I because it's huge. Mm -hmm. Like yeah, I mean, how can we talk about food without talking about meat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. That and within the states, there's just so much like unlearning, and there's so much here too. It's funny. Yeah, Almost. like almost laughable yeah I don't know I don't know how yeah it's it's crazy that like even just like saying hey like let's have like a vegan meal to some people is just it like they're like excuse me like that like they get like personally yeah. offended that a meal wouldn't have me <laughs> in it it's yeah like, since when does meat consumption a part of your identity, dude? Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm you, your, I... your male fragility is showing, you know, it's why <laughs> it's just like, I'm going to use that line. I've been trying to figure <laughs> out. So here's something um, I'm just going to share here. Cause I don't think my dad watches this podcast. I think it would make him mad every week and then he would yell at me. So I'm going to, talk some shit about Paul Wallace right now because he's that person he has to eat meat at every meal yeah love you dad that's not great for you you don't need to eat meat at every meal you don't there are other no. sources of protein but okay. healthy and, and yeah in terms of your health it's better if you don't um but what I, what I really want to do is get a meat substitute when he is here Mm -hmm. And just get like, be like, yeah, okay. So I bought some, I bought some meat things, some meat products and just like, you know, put them in a different package. That's like, yeah. not that. I mean, it's in Dutch probably. It's so all in Dutch anyway. So yeah. <laughs> it doesn't fucking know. And then just make it. And then, uh, so. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because we actually yeah. do in our house eat more vegetarian meat products now than we eat like hamburger and stuff mm -hmm. they're actually really yummy burrito they, yeah. with not meat I just I call it all not meat so but burritos <laughs> with like <laughs> fake ground beef yeah super good yeah they're yeah. so good they're high in protein it's all plant-based it's wonderful mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. doesn't kill an animal 
Yeah. It, the, the innovation in, in like plant-based proteins and meat substitutes has been pretty cool to watch over the past few years, just to see oh my you know, God. how much that has grown. Um, the difference my mom was, has, my mom's been a vegetarian since she was like 12 and growing up in the household in a household with a dude that really has to eat meat with every meal and a vegetarian Mm -hmm. was so interesting because my dad always had options, but my mom didn't. And we, we always cooked our veggies and our meat separate so that we could eat together. But seeing, going to the grocery store and seeing a fridge full of products that my mom could eat that aren't just vegetables that are actually like she can join in the barbecue. Yeah. You know, it Mm -hmm. makes me so excited. I'm not even a vegetarian, but I know how much she struggled, you know, to go to out to fast food and be like, can you just put a slice of cheese on bread? Can I have cheese on bread? I guess I'll just have french fries yeah 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 the that has been really really incredible to watch just that like the level of access there and again that is primarily just in large grocery stores so so that and that access is not everywhere of course but but it's in more places like walmart has yeah I haven't been to a Walmart in a very long time, but like if you go to a, one of one of those that yeah. has like a grocery store in it, they definitely have a section that's like plant-based options. That's that are, fantastic. That like, you know, fake chicken nuggets or whatever they are, but like they're, they're still yeah. processed and packaged. Okay, that's of course. Fine, but like, whoa, revolutionary yeah, sometimes that's the 10 years you know ago. Burger King has a plant-based burger. Right, right. Yeah, Impossible Which, Burgers at Carl's Jr. Yeah, yeah. like it, it is being embraced. Starbucks has an Impossible burger. Really? Or, or not burger, but like they have like a, yeah, and fake McDonald's sausage. has a chicken nugget. And I think that they're missing out on having the plant-based burger because yeah, just are. But, but I can, I don't eat chicken and I haven't eaten chicken in many years, but I can eat the one at McDonald's because it is not real chicken. So if Tom wants to go there, then we, we don't go to the regular food. chicken nuggets are not real chicken. What do you No, no, they like, have a new chicken oh, they nugget. Have a, oh. They have a new chicken nugget, like country style chicken. Whoa. That plant is not plant. Yes. That's I'm like, what am I saying? <laughs> it's plant-based chicken burger. It's fake chicken. It's ficken. They have fake <laughs> ficken. It's <laughs> Yeah. Wait, that's awesome. I don't know if I, well, I, again, I don't, I don't know. I'm not up on the latest like McDonald's news. So, but yeah. that's for, that's right. I, I don't know if that's Euro because, based. Yeah. I, we go to, I'm embarrassingly go to fast food way more often now because I'm fucking tired building a house. Half the yeah. week. So I'm like, I have to go to the, I, I guess we'd have to go again to, you know, Hornbach, the, um, like the Home Depot store, the house building store. I guess we need to stop buying get food right. somehow. I mean, it. right. To some extent, right. At some points in your life, eating food just is sort of like a utilitarian thing. It's just like, give me whatever yes. sustenance fast. I don't care. Um, yeah. And I'm not anti-fast food either. I don't want to be a foodie that's anti-drive-through, mm-hmm. but I do want to hold drive throughs and these large companies like Burger King and McDonald's to a yeah. standard of food that like we need to be able to expect that our food is like safe to eat not going to poison us in the long term not going to like you know Mm -hmm. give us diabetes or chemicals or whatever yeah and that we have that we have options for that yeah 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 no absolutely yeah I think there is definitely there is and will always be a place for for fast food in this country that's not or and I mean the world um but yeah them just taking that extra step to be a little bit more inclusive in in their yeah. offerings it's yeah. not a huge lift and no like, and shout out to in and out for doing it for having their own cow farm and for having their secret menu where you can like get lots of options. They do a pretty, they actually do a pretty a plant-based good burger though. No, I'm not surprised by that. They don't have a plant-based burger, but, but yeah, you, I mean, you can have a grilled cheese if you want, but again, that's, 
Yeah. Yeah. But they're, they are intentional with their meat production. So I appreciate that about that company. Yeah. Yeah. There, there are steps being made. Um, but there are so many more, a, a lot of it, I do think is sort of performative in some way where they are kind of just like, oh, okay. One big chain started an impossible burger. So that's now a competitive edge. So they, uh, so their competitors are kind of, you know, jumping on the bandwagon a bit, but it's not a bad, not a bad bandwagon. No, choosing yeah. the sustainable bandwagon is never bad, mm-hmm. right? If you do it right. You know, I think being a mainstream thing isn't inherently bad. Being copied at mainstream isn't inherently bad. A lot of people feel that way, you know, but. Mm. No, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> we have a meeting. Um, I do. A lot of, it's okay. yeah. Oh, yeah. So I think a lot of people feel like mainstream is selling out and bringing sustainability and bringing these types of measures into the mainstream is one of our main goals. And I think it's Mm -hmm. not, it's not, it can't be a bad thing. We have to move in that direction. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 And we can't always assume, I suppose to, to kind of correct myself, we can't always assume that a company making that choice is doing it to try to capitalize on the popularity that it is performative in a way. I mean, it may seem that way, but it's, but it's also just like, there's a market for it. There's a market yeah, for people who want a plant-based exactly. option. And that's awesome. These are, these are right. people who are sticking to their guns who would want a plant-based yeah. option. And for these businesses that are massive, they don't have to do anything to, to offer something to these people, but they choose to. So that is cool movement. Yeah. I'll give them that. Yeah. And also they get a competitive edge from it. Yeah. You know, like there's a market, they get an edge from it. Like at some point, even if it is a performative choice in the beginning, it becomes, it, be, it becomes its own symbol within the movement yeah you know a big step regardless yeah 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 man we've got a lot to touch on that is for darn sure um so much and Um, (laughs) we're gonna be next week right next week we're gonna be reading over the next week yeah Uh, yes farming Uh, for the long haul by michael foley mm -hmm really excited to read this book yeah it seemed like a really good fit because it is so focused on um that long haul right create how can we farm sustainably yep yeah for now and for the future uh yeah yeah and we i mean we really chose it because the um the bio about it immediately made this transition between renewable energies and needing to move in that way and needing to also move in the sustainable way for agriculture. So it like triggered us to be like, this book is also where we are. And it, it yeah. talks about sustainability as a whole and it sees the holistic picture like we're trying to do. So it, we really resonated with, with the bio and I'm really excited. Yes, that yeah, absolutely. I, I'm I'm really looking forward to it. That will be. Um, I think we'll learn a lot. Yeah. I yeah, I'm excited to know what questions I still have after that book. Like, will mm-hmm. our questions change? Will our idea about agriculture shift? you know, maybe we'll have better solutions that aren't just like start a community garden, Mm -hmm. you know, that's not, that's not a realistic thing for everyone. Right. For most people, I would say How much time does that take? And also, then, yeah, right. That's a lot of time. That's a lot of upkeep and it's money too, to build uh, that stuff and space. It's not cheap to have a garden, right? You need land are you on? Yeah. 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 Where do you find that? So yeah, that's not the solution for everyone. Yeah, just like have a backyard garden. Just like, no, you just like Oprah does it. Why can't you? Okay, that's not the solution. <laughs> no, and this yeah. is where access and yeah. intentional and, you know, like racist, 
how do I want to say it? Like racist po- politics comes into play. Yeah. And when you start talking about things like community gardens, it's like, it's awesome. That's a great idea. If you have access to that in your community, that's great. Mm. But we live in a reality where black and Hispanic families are twice as likely to be food insecure. That's not Mm. an accident. And these places, these, this marginalized group of humans don't have all, always have access to creating a community garden. And they also don't always have access to the knowledge that a community garden is possible or to what power they have to be food sovereign, you know? So there's not a, there's not a deep seated educational piece. Mm-mm. Right. There needs some to be, yeah, someone who's like leading it and yeah, there needs to be space and who's paying for it and who, right who's organizing, who's taking care of things. Like this is all, yeah, like the logistics of all that. It can't just happen. And and especially in places like like where I am, like people don't talk to their neighbors. Like you just don't. Like no one there, like there really is a lack of community in in a sense. And and in a lot of places, I think that's true. And so it, yeah, I think that that's a really naive solution to just say like community gardens are the answer, but like, of course it's, it should be encouraged and, right. you know, if, like if there should possible. be organizations being developed that are making that, that can make that possible, that can, right. can you know, help fund shows, that kind of stuff. Totally. Also, like just environmentally, it's not always possible. You live in a really industrial yeah. area, for instance. I wouldn't mm-hmm. want to eat food from a community garden. <laughs> well, you it's funny because it's also super agricultural. So you might already be, you know? <laughs> you know? Exactly. <laughs> There's like, monocrop farms all over the place. And, they and how much chemical? Fast. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know to what extent they're, they're spraying chemicals or whatever. They're definitely there's a little airport so there's there's always little planes flying around but um yeah they're often covered in plastic um like the when they plant the seeds they cover the dirt in plastic like they cover these mounds in plastic to make humidity I imagine yeah some some crops grow better that way yeah 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 I imagine it kind of keeps them short so the roots grow deeper maybe but Mm -hmm. um yeah, it's been really fascinating to watch over the past. I mean, I, I moved down here six, uh, I don't even know, in September or whatever. I don't know how many months that is, but um, watching really? the progression of those different fields where they do um, farm is it's really, really wild, the turnover and, and just... Yeah, it seems like they would have three crops a year. You there's could, more than that, man. There, it is faster than that it is crazy more than three yes yes oh yes like yeah within a month like they could take like an empty field put stuff in it and have it like and then like harvest it and it's then empty again it is crazy yeah it it, like there was one that was like artichokes that all of a sudden just like popped up And then they harvested it and then cut them all down and now it's dirt again. Whoa. It's really fast. Yeah. And when will they replant it? Um, I don't know that particular field, but it does. Yeah. I mean, they kind of, they're not empty for long. That's for sure. Yeah. Whoa. Um, Yeah. Yeah. It's really it's a trip. It's a trip to watch. It's not something I've ever really seen before or had access to, to seeing. Um, and there's a, a massive farm worker community. Um, yeah. Whoa. I've never heard of that before. That, Which, what? That, I've heard of like in places you can get in places like California, you can um, change your crops over if you're growing naturally and have like three harvests in a year. That's normal because it's always nice and sunny if you, you know, mm-hmm. but that sounds like a really fast, it sounds it's, like 
much faster than I yeah. ever imagined. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, but again, these are not these. There's there, these aren't organic farms guaranteed. They're not. Yeah. Yeah. They're not. Um, and it's really next to industry. How do they keep the heavy metals out? They don't. Gosh, what have we been eating? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's pretty crazy. And well, we right, and yet we wonder why people are sicker and you know, mm-hmm. yeah. Anywho. That's something I want to research now. <laughs> how fast can like Yeah. How many yields can they can they have? And and are they they're monocropping at a single time, but are they yeah. putting different plants in all the time so that their soil stays? That does seem like that's what's what's happening. Yeah, because it's not always the same plant. Like they, yeah, right. they. Um, so that's an interesting thing. And like, who does? Who's making that decision? I don't know. I don't know how that. Yeah. Science. And sometimes they just put a bunch of flowers. That's also another thing, which is and then, that makes sense. Yeah. Right. So. Th- and they often are kind of lined with not wildflowers, but flowers um, to bring in bees, which is cool. Like in the middle? Uh, like around yeah. the rows of crops, like yeah. just kind of as a square, like a frame kind of, yeah. Um, or they're just sort of intermittent little piles of dirt flowers. with flowers growing, yeah. That's nice. Which is are cool. Are they yellow? Orange and yellow. Orange and yellow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was reading about about marigolds being really good marigolds calendulas mm-hmm. orange yellow flowers yeah um, they're really really good for soil for plants I like food plants in particular mm. so maybe that's what they're doing yeah it's sort of a mystery and it's it changes all the time and every time i drive around i'm like that's different <laughs> like they are they move fast man it is crazy and and a lot of it happens at like four in the morning you know you can you can be there late at night and then if you come back at 6 a.m it is a totally different scene whoa Um, yeah stuff happens really 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 early um interesting I don't know it's a whole world I've never been a part of but uh, I now learn more be secondhand yeah and yeah absolutely it is um gonna be a really really fascinating month so yeah yeah um that's what we'll be diving into I think that oh I don't know if I'm ready (laughs) yeah um anyways I don't know if you guys have any like resources that you think are really are you know cool organizations that are doing something in terms of food production food waste food sovereignty you know anything yeah. like that. that would be really cool we would love to know it mm-hmm. or if you guys have any questions yeah what do you want to know about food waste and and agriculture let us know yeah put a comment. also if you okay. like our podcast and all and the other things that we put out on this channel just like it and subscribe because that helps YouTube know that you want more of this kind of stuff and you definitely do because it's interesting and it's important yes and um yeah that would we would really appreciate that we will be back next week with more so stay tuned and um yeah thank you for watching yeah (laughs) bye